Okay, this is the first day of Physics 1C, the first lecture of Physics 1C for um, September 1st. And today we are going to be talking about electric fields. And uh, you got it, Ricky. That's great to hear. That's really great to hear. Okay, so electric fields, that's uh, the goal. I don't know if we're actually going to get to electric fields today. That's kind of just the name of the chapter. Today what we're going to be talking about are the topics of static electricity, like when you get shocked when you open a car door sometimes or touch a metal knob. We're going to define what electric charges are and talk about charge conservation. We're going to discuss the difference between conductors and insulators and tell you kind of what's different about them, uh, maybe at the molecular level, I don't know. Just kind of talk about what the properties of them that are different are and, and what makes them different. And then we're going to get to Coulomb's Law and Superposition of Forces. This is probably all we will manage to talk about today. And then the other topics, which are also from this same chapter, that's chapter 21 in your book. Uh, we'll get to these probably next time. If I can, I hopefully can get up to here. I hope. All right. So, um, static electricity. So let's talk about kind of a history of electricity and how we know what we know. I heard someone uh, someone's mic got cued there, so I'll try to pay attention to who that was. But try to keep your mics uh, muted if you can, so we don't get any feedback. Okay. So, historically, uh, how did we uh, how did we first learn about electricity? So. The first people to know anything about the properties of what we nowadays call electricity, um, at least according to your book and other sources, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure that there are other civilizations that figured this out as well, but um, apparently the ancient Greeks found um, bits of something called amber. They had bits of amber that they would find. And does anyone know what amber is? It's obviously a name. It's like tree sap, yeah? And it's tree sap that's become hardened over time. And it's now kind of almost like a plastic in a way. Yeah, if you, in Jurassic Park, like that's how they like, that's the stories that like there was a mosquito that was trapped in amber and then they, they extracted its blood and it had dinosaur DNA in it and so they made dinosaurs, right? So that's, that's amber, it comes from tree sap. So what they figured out was that if you, um, you're hearing a lot of feedback, Stefan, is anybody else hearing feedback? Try leaving the channel and then coming back in and rejoining the stream, Stefan, because it sounds like it's on your side. Sorry that you're hearing feedback, I know that's very annoying. So what the Greeks figured out is that amber, when rubbed with like the fur of an animal or something like that, would have this unique property that if you took the amber then and you brought it next to little small pieces of lint or small pieces of like hair or anything like that, it could attract um, little tiny, you know, things like that. Really things that are really light, basically. Um, we'll just say it could attract small little things. Okay, and so this is the first um, appearance of uh, this force that is uh, clearly very different than gravity, right? At this time, the Greeks certainly understood what gravity was, right? They didn't understand it like you do now after taking like Physics 1A. You, you understand gravity better than they did probably. But they understood that gravity makes things fall towards the Earth, right? And so here was a force that, that could actually levitate things in a way. You could take a piece of amber, you could rub it with fur, and it could attract tiny little things. Well, let's jump forward to modern day, and let's talk about how you could, how you could reproduce the experiment that they did right now in your home if you really wanted to. So it turns out that if you take, for example, a piece of plastic, okay? Let's say you take like a piece of like PVC pipe. PVC pipe works really, really well if you happen to have some of that um, sitting around your house for some reason. Um, so you take a piece of plastic, right? And what you do is you take some piece of some kind of a fur, okay? So I'm just gonna say you've got a piece of something that's got little hairs coming off of it to represent that it's like fur. It could be fake fur, it could be real fur, it doesn't really matter, okay? So you take something that is like hair basically, okay? We'll just say it's covered in some kind of a hair, we'll call it fur. Apologies to uh, to animal lovers out there. Um, so you take this, you rub the fur on the plastic, okay? This repeats what they had done. Now, of course, they didn't have plastic. And what will happen if you rub the fur on the plastic, okay? Is that as a result of the vigorous rubbing of the fur on the plastic, something kind of uh, special will happen. And what will happen is that the plastic will develop an electrical charge, 
okay? The plastic will suddenly, as a result of rubbing the fur on the plastic, the plastic is going to develop a, uh, a charge, okay? As a result of doing this, what's gonna happen is that your plastic rod now, let's use the same color, your plastic rod now is going to be positive, or sorry, negative, my bad. Uh, it's going to be electrically charged and it's going to be negatively charged, okay? So I'm gonna put a bunch of negative signs around this to just say that this thing has become charged, okay? It's become negatively charged. Most things are positive. So as Johnny is saying, as a result, what's gonna to happen to the fur is the fur is gonna become positively charged. So here's our fur. The fur has now become positively charged. Let's use red positive so it shows up. This one is gonna become positively charged. And now you can do things with this piece of plastic, and I will show you these things when we get into the lab, but what you could do with the plastic is you can bring it close to a bunch of little tiny pieces of paper, and it will magically levitate the paper. Now, this thing of the two objects becoming charged, and we'll talk about what a negative charge and what a positive charge is here in a moment, but um, this is something you can kind of experience at home, and this is an example of how you can do that. If you have any, like, plastic combs, you obviously have hair on your head, a lot of you do. I don't really have much, but a lot of you probably have hair on your head. If you take a plastic comb and you run it through your hair enough times, then the comb will become negatively charged, okay? And what you can do is your hair, which is like the fur, is gonna become positively charged. So you can take that, you can take that, uh, um, that comb, you can hold it next to your head and it will actually cause the hairs on your head to lift up and be attracted to it. You can use a balloon too, exactly. You can rub a balloon like on your shirt or you can rub a balloon on your hair. And then if you, again, you bring it next to your hair, you'll see your hair stand up. A really good way to do it is to do it with your arm hair. I have to use my arm hair because I don't have any hair on my head. But if you take a balloon, you rub it on your shirt and you bring it next to your arm, you'll see that the hairs of your arm will all stand up basically, all right? And this is, this is the basic phenomenon of static electricity. The idea that when you rub objects together, something happens to make one of them develop a negative charge and one of them develop a positive charge. We'll talk about what happens. How do we know which one's positive or negative? That's just great. That's a great question, Tom. So we know now because we've done a lot of experiments and we can kind of determine the negative or the positive charge based on some other things we're going to talk about here. But let's talk about the most basic piece of electricity that uh, you probably all have learned at some point in time. If I have an object that's positively charged, okay, and I bring it close to an object that's negatively charged, right? I have a positive object and I have a negative object. What happens to these two objects if they're placed together and allowed to move? They attract? They attract each other. There's a kind of force that pulls them together, right? And it's going to be an equal and opposite force, right? Now, if the two charges have the same sign, whether it be positive or negative, I do two positive forces two positive charges, we put them near each other, they're gonna push each other away, right? And again, it's gonna be the same force on each object, depending on the size of the charges. Okay, so same charges repel, different charges attract. And that's why, you know, if you rub your shirt with a, a balloon, that you can lift up the hair on your arm. Now, um, let's, let's look at uh, a demo or a visualization of how this might happen as shown right here so I'm just gonna tell you uh, as we talked about last time every object in the universe is made up of protons and neutrons right let's go ahead and let's go ahead and mention this right now before we get into what we're about to say right here okay everything in the universe is made up of protons neutrons and uh, electrons right matter is made of protons neutrons, which are neutral, and electrons. Electrons, which I symbolize with an E minus like this, electrons are negative. That's the electron. Protons are positive. We'll use this symbol for a proton. 
they are positive. And neutrons are neutral. They, mean, they carry no charge at all. We use an N with a zero to represent that they're neutral. These are the fundamental constituents of matter. Your entire body is made up of only electrons, protons, and neutrons when you break down your atoms uh, to their, their core parts, right? Now, what's actually happening when you rub the fur onto the plastic or when you rub a, a balloon on your shirt? What's happening is that electrons from the plastic transfer um, from the fur onto the plastic. Electrons from the fur go from the fur to the plastic in the rubbing process. The rubbing process actually breaks the electrons away from their atoms and causes a flow of electrons from the fur to this object. And so you get all these electrons that are, that are additionally added to your plastic, okay? As a result, these electrons flow onto the plastic from the fur. And as a result, the plastic becomes negatively charged. That's the physical process that's happening when you charge something. And this process, yes, Evan, it would be like trillions of electrons. That's exactly right. It's not just going to be three. It'd be like lots and lots and lots and lots of electrons are going to be transferred in this process. Um, and we call this process charging by conduction. Conduction means that you're touching something. You're using that, that friction of rubbing to charge something. Another way that you can experience this is if you scuff your feet on the floor especially if you're wearing like um, some kind of insulating shoes. If you scuff your feet on the floor, wait, that's wrong. So let's just say you scuff your feet on the floor and you have like some shaggy carpet and you can, you can develop a charge by this conduction process and then you can walk up and you can shock someone. Yeah, with socks, it works really well, right? So if you, if you have socks on and you rub your feet on the floor, you can walk up to someone and you can, you can shock them, right? It has to be kind of dry outside for it to work but it's generally pretty dry around here, right? Okay, so charging by conduction is the process by which electrons are transferred from one object onto another. Most objects are neutral to begin with. So this is why when I take a piece of fur and I move a bunch of electrons onto the plastic, right? The plastic has to then be negative, And as a result, the fur has to be positive. How do we know that there's not protons that are getting transferred? How do we know that it can really only be electrons that are getting, why am I telling you it's electrons and not protons that are getting transferred? Protons are stable. They are stable as in they don't decay. Can you say more about that? What do you mean? Protons are in the nucleus, right. And it's very hard to get the protons out of the nucleus, right? There's a, it, takes, it takes an immense amount of force to get the protons out of the nucleus, right? Or you have to bombard the nucleus with extra neutrons to make it unstable so that it decays, right? So protons tend to stick around where they are, right? So that means anything that is positively charged, okay? Anything that is positively charged is positively charged because it's missing electrons, right? Does that make sense? The only reason it's positively charged is because it's lost electrons. Something that's negatively charged has more electrons than it normally would. That's what charges are, by the way. Charges are just electrons. That's what you should be thinking for most of the time in this class. That in the simplest possible way, an electric charge is an electron that carries a negative charge. And it's just a question of how many more do you have or how many are you missing that determines what your charge is. So let's look at let's look at this little demo right here. It's not much of a demo, but so what we have is we have a shirt. You'll notice that the shirt has an equal number of positive and negative charges. We have a balloon. The balloon also has an equal number of positive and negative charges. We also have a wall. Equal numbers of positive and negative charges. Again, this is because most objects uh, are neutral by default. Okay, so. We can, uh, we can charge the balloon if we want to, right? Because we've got balloon, which is made of rubber. And we've got a shirt, which is made of some type of a material, some type of like, you know, linen, polyester, wool, something like that. Let's say it's a wool shirt. And what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, we're gonna rub this on here. The rubbing process has now made the balloon negative, as you can see, right? And of course, because the balloon is negative, you'll see that if I try to just let go of it, 
it's automatically attracted to the shirt, right? It's attracted to the shirt because, well, the balloon is more negative and the shirt is now positive, so they have to attract each other according to our rule, right? Does that make sense to everybody? All right, let's reset the balloon and let's get some more charges on it. So we're gonna, we swept up every single charge that was on there. Now, what other, there's a couple other things we can do here. We can have two balloons. Let's look at some things that are going on here. So first thing to notice is, can I get rid of the shirt? Nope, can't get rid of the shirt. One thing to notice here is that uh, our balloon right now is negatively charged. What's the charge on the green balloon though? Neutral. It's neutral, right? So this green balloon is not really attracted to this balloon. You'll see, it's not attracted at all. But of course, if we, let's reset our balloons. If we give each of them a little bit of a charge, so I give that one some charge, and then we give this one some charge too. Now, they should repel from each other, right? And they do. Of course, this is still attracted to this. I wish we could get rid of the shirt entirely, but the balloons should repel each other. Yeah, you can see that this one is repelling away from this one. But there's something else that's happening here, right? What happens when the balloon gets hit on the wall? What do you notice? Look what's happening inside the wall. Do you notice what's happening? The electron shift. The electron shift, right? Now, what's the uh, what's the charge on the wall? The wall is what? It's neutral, right? Equal neutral. numbers of positive and negative charges, right? So why does the balloon then seem to be attracted to the wall? And here, let me let me make sure that let's let's just do one balloon so that it's clear that it's not okay. So this should be attracted to this, right? It is. But if we get close enough to the wall, it'll actually stick to the wall. Yes, the yellow balloon would be attracted to the shirt too. So the electrons inside of here, you can very clearly see that they've shifted. And then what, what's the effect of them shifting? The wall is still neutral, but what's happening right here next to the wall? It's pushing the negative electron, or the electrons away so that it's gonna be uh, attracted to the protons in the wall. Yeah, polarization, what Kavi is saying is absolutely right. And there's a small positive zone. That's right, Patrick, exactly. And then the negative charges of the balloon are now attracted to the locally positive charges here. So this actually shows us something about the nature of electricity that is probably not super obvious, or maybe it is, I don't know. Even though the wall as a whole is neutral, because there are, there's a section of the wall that has become kind of positive and because those positive charges are closer to the electrons in the balloon than the negative charges out here, these, these charges win in the fight, right? Keep in mind that these negative charges here are still trying to repel the balloon, right? After all, the balloon pushed them back. These must be pushing back on the balloon. But the positive charges that are close are winning. That tells you that electricity is stronger when objects are closer together. The attractive force is stronger when objects are closer together, right? The other thing to say is that um, uh, you can you can locally induce a positive charge as a result of these negative charges being near it. This is an important factor with electricity too. Okay, this is kind of cool. This just shows the charge differences. So you can't actually see the charges until you start rubbing. And then, yeah. Have any of you ever done this thing where you take a balloon, you rub it on your shirt, and then you stick it on a wall, and then it just stays there? Has anyone ever done that or seen that before? If you've got any balloons in your house, you can try it out if you haven't tried it. You just take a balloon, blow it up really big, right? So that it's nice and thin. Yeah, you can rub it on your hair. Hair works great. And uh, yeah, you should be able to get to stick to a wall. Unfortunately, every time I do this demo when we're at school, this, this part of the demo never works, but it works nice in this visualization here, right? Okay, so, all right, let's, uh, let's continue on. So we have this idea that, uh, how come the balloon is only negative? What do you mean only negative? Oh, in the previous one, why, were there, why was it only negative? I think I turned off the, it said to only show it here. This is show charge differences. Oh, could it become positive? I mean, there's definitely ways that we can make the balloon positive, but what I'm trying to tell you, Johnny, is that the process of rubbing something like rubber on something like wool or animal fur or something like that, 
will make the rubber negative, okay? And if you wanna know more about that and why one thing becomes negative and one thing's become positive, then you can read about this, triboelectric. Um, so there's basically, it's, it's a, uh, it's like a, oh look at that, it's a cat that's been, has a bunch of uh, styrofoam peanuts attracted to it, that's really funny. Um, so where is it? Right here, right here, right here. There's basically a list of more positively charged and down here most negatively charged, okay? Now look at the very bottom, you see silicone rubbers right here and stuff like plastic wrap, plastic wrap, Plastic wrap works off of the off of how uh, static electricity works, right? You know how plastic wrap will just like stick to things. Uh, it'll stick to things like um, oh, I don't know, glass, right? You take you take saran wrap, right, and you wrap it around glass. It'll stick to the glass, right? Uh, it's not necessarily related to conductivity, no, Haiti. It's not but we will talk about conductivity later. Why are natural things, is that what it is? Or are these all natural up here? Let's see, cat's fur, silk is natural, paper is natural, rabbit's fur, leather. Glass is like sand, I don't know if that, I don't know. Are these things, is there anything natural down here? Wax and amber are pretty natural, right? Um. So anyway, the point is this. If you take something that's on the negative side and you rub it against something that's up higher on the list than it, then the thing that's lower on the list will be the thing that comes negative, right? So you can wrap, you can take PVC, you can rub it with anything up here. So like paper, you can rub PVC with paper. But the farther you get on the positive side, the more effective it becomes. So notice that hair is like the highest up here. So hair rubbed with on vinyl will produce a huge amount of charge. Huge amount of charge. The charge is really big, by the way. When you do this, when I take, when you take a piece of like plastic and you rub it with fur, you have to rub it like pretty well. And then you take the fur away. If you even put your hand near the plastic, you'll feel just how strong the electricity coming off of it is. With the static electricity. So anyway, triboelectric effect. That describes what becomes positive and what becomes negative. And to go back to a question that you asked earlier, it was uh, Ton, you had asked, how do we know what's positive and what's negative? We have to just do experiments. And then we have to use um, devices that can help us tell what's positive and negative. And um, one device you can use is called an electrometer. Is that what it's called? No, 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 what is it? Oh, we have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. I know you're still on. Please, go ahead. Wait, you had a question? Sadly, most of my static light experience comes from my car door shocking me. Yeah, me too. Do you have uh, cloth seats in your car, Evan? Nope. You got like leather seats? It happens on either one. Anyway, for me, I've got cloth seats. I've got a car that's made of, I don't know. And uh, when I touch the uh, the door handle, which is plastic, I can shock myself pretty pretty quickly. Yeah, I don't get it on the seat. I get it when I open the door, basically. Your belts, though? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Jiz, you, you said you wanted to ask a question, but I didn't hear what you said. So, uh... Sorry, that was, that was incorrect. Oh, gotcha. That's fine. Okay, so, charging by conduction involves rubbing objects, making them positively or negatively charged. Now, this is kind of just an introduction to what electricity is, but we have to start from the basics, and this is our, uh... This is kind of our first, um... Oh yeah, sliding down a slide, like at a park. Those plastic slides will definitely do it. You'll definitely get some really strong shocks off of that. Because after all, when you, that's a really good example that I think probably a lot of people have an experience with. Like if you go, if you go to a park with like your, your children or your, your nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, whatever, if they're like made of plastic, which they often are, and you slide down them, you'll, you'll develop a huge amount of like uh, a charge on your body and you'll definitely be able to shock people, shock yourself. You'll just shock yourself walking away from the slide, right? Isn't that usually what happens? Um, and that's, why is it? Well, it's because the slide's made of plastic or some something similar to plastic, right? 
and you're sliding on it with clothing that is basically like fur, right? And so you develop this this big charge because you're you're developing a lot of friction, and the, and the friction is the conduction that creates this that makes this happen, right? Okay. So I've got a couple little uh, pictures here from your book just to show you some of the things that we just talked about. It's uh, something that I like. I say we, we, I'll show you this stuff when we're when we're on campus, but we gotta at least talk about it now. So um, let's let's go through these things one by one relatively quickly here. Um, on the left hand side, we have the picture of the charge balloon that's creating this induced charge separation that we saw. As a result, the positively charged balloon can connect to the wall. They choose to make the po the, ch the balloon positive here. Don't don't take that to mean anything. They just chose to make it positive in their picture. Um, the idea that a charge rod can attract little bits of paper. This is the one that you can kind of try yourself by like combing your hair. You can use the comb to try to pick up bits of paper. And again, taking the comb and putting it near your, your the hairs on your arm will do the same thing. Okay, what's going on in these pictures right here? Okay. You take two plastic rods, you suspend one of them so that it's free to kind of rotate and move. And he's he kind of note that two plastic rods neither attract or repel each other. You take both of the plastic rods, you rub them on fur, they will develop the exact same charge, and this one's negative, this one's negative. You bring this one near this one, as a result, it's going to feel a force that's going to push it back to the left. This is basically just the idea that same charge repels. In the second slide here, plain glass rods neither attract or repel each other, but if you take glass and you rub it with silk, the glass will become positive. Okay, so if you want to know how to generate a positive charge, this is one way to do it. You just take the glass and you rub it with silk. Maybe you have access to this in your house. Maybe you have a way to try this yourself. This one, I've always found that getting a charge on a glass rod is quite challenging. And you will see that whenever I try to show this to you in class. But the idea is that silk rubbed on glass gives you a positive charge. And of course, if you take a negatively charged rod that's plastic, that's negative, a glass rod that's positive, and you put them next to each other and they're allowed to swing in some way, then they'll attract each other. And again, this, this attraction is not going to be very strong unless, uh, I don't know, again, like I said, I, I've tried this demo with class several times over the course of the 10 years that I've been teaching physics. I can almost never get a very strong charge on glass, and I don't really know what the reason for that is. According to the physics textbooks, it's really easy, but I've never been able to get it to work very well. Nonetheless, uh, I mean, I can get it to work, it just isn't that strong. When you take two, when you do this, this is a really strong effect that you'll see. Uh, and then, of course, as someone asked earlier, the fur, when you rub it on plastic, becomes positive. So the fur attracts the, the rod that's plastic, and the silk should attract the glass rod because the silk should become negative. Anyway, so that's kind of a summary of just concepts like this. Doesn't humidity play a factor in the amount of charge you can get from doing that? 100%. That's a very good point, Justin. It's a very, very good point. In fact, whenever I do these demos, we're going to have a hairdryer that we're going to use to dry everything out and make sure it's as dry as possible when we're doing that. Why would humidity play a role? Why would that be the case? Why would it matter if it's dry air versus humid air? Any ideas? It kind of ties directly into what uh, we're into. Go ahead. Isn't it because water isn't... Um not soluble, but it's not, uh, I can't remember the chemistry term for it, but it basically doesn't uh, conduct electricity very well. So uh, between the two objects, if it was no, if there was water in the air, then it would make it hard for, elect for um, electrons to jump from one object to another. Okay. So most of what you said, I think, is uh, on the right track. Someone says water has charges. It does. It's the water molecules neutral. Water is a dipole, as Patrick says. Um, I believe it's because the water increases the conductivity. So it's a, a little bit the opposite of what you said. Um, so water in the air increases the conductivity of the air, which makes it more likely. That the, so let's think about what we're doing here. When we rub fur on plastic, we're adding electrons to the fur, right? We're adding electrons to the plastic, right? So if there's water in the air, those electrons kind of have a, a pathway that they can get out of the plastic and kind of into the air. Does that make sense? That they can kind of attach themselves to water molecules in the air and be carried off. 
something like that, right? Does that make any sense? Do you know when it will be? I think that's making sense, so Professor. Do you mind if I come in and voice and try to explain it? Yeah, go ahead. Not like explain it. Someone was talking not, in your like, background. Explain it, tell but... me not to talk, but yeah. Uh, no, it's it's uh, wifey. She's on an important VA call, actually. Okay, you can go ahead and explain if you want to. Go ahead. Patrick, go ahead. You said you wanted to explain something, right? Sorry, I have a difficult time going back and forth between the chat and the video, but it's like this. Um, like, imagine trying to carry water in a fabric hat, basically. So the plastic in wet air that's uh, has an excess of electrons, picture that as like trying to carry water in like a fabric bag. The electrons have a clear pathway out of the plastic into the wet air because of the positive dipole moment of the water molecules, uh, let's call it the excess water molecules in the more moist air, whereas they have less of a pathway out of the plastic yep. into the dry air because yep. there is not as much water to allow that flow of electrons. You got it. That's exactly right. I can give you another example that's related to this as well. Um, you're going to have to go ahead and turn off your mic. It's getting, thank you. Um, so when your body is fully submerged in water, you are much more likely to be affected by an electric shock. And it's because your body becomes a much better conductor of electricity when it's wet than when it's dry. So water in the air basically helps to conduct the electrons away from the object. That's the simplest part of that, I guess. Okay. So, next thing to talk about. Um, electric charges and charge conservation. So we just mentioned that every piece of matter is made out of electrons, protons, and neutrons, right? And we also said that uh, charges are basically a result of either a deficiency or an excess of electrons. So we can make the following statements about electric charges. So all charges, all electric charges come in units of the charge of a single electron. Now, if we're gonna describe electric charge in this class, we're gonna to have to quantify it, right? This is physics after all, it's not philosophy. We can't just talk about electric charge as if it's this ephemeral thing. We would like to measure how much charge does something have? How do I compare the charge on one rod to another rod? Or how do I compare the charge on this glass rod to the charge on this right here? And in order to do that, we gotta come up with a, a unit for charges, right? So the, the unit that we use for electric charge is the Coulomb, okay? One Coulomb. And we use capital C for that, one capital C. Now it turns out that one Coulomb is a massive, massive, massive amount of charge, okay? Huge amount of charge. To give you an idea of how big one Coulomb is, okay? Suppose that I have a rain cloud, okay? I know it's hard to imagine here in California where we never get rain and we never get thunder and lightning, but suppose that I have a rain cloud and this rain cloud sends a shock to the ground, okay? There's a, a lightning strike, right? That hits the ground, right? When lightning strikes, there's a transfer in one direction, up or down, it's not really important. It depends on if the clouds, usually I think that the, the way this travels is the other way, but I think usually the ground is negative and the, and the cloud becomes really positive. And what ends up happening, as we'll learn later in this class, is that when you have one object that's really, really positive and one object that's really, really, really negative, if there's enough charge in the cloud compared to the ground, then there's gonna be what we call a discharge, a shock. A, a, a lightning strike is no different than when you get shocked on a slide or in your car or in your house from rubbing your feet on the floor, right? They're all the same things. I mean, I'm sure if you turn the lights out and you see a shock, it looks like a little tiny lightning bolt, right? So in that process, something on the order of 30 coulombs is transferred from the, uh, the cloud to the ground. That much charge. On the order of 30 coulombs is transferred in a lightning strike. Now I'm sure nobody in here wants to be hit by lightning. And you have an idea that lightning is this awesome, powerful force of nature, right? So when I say that one coulomb is large, I mean that one coulomb is like a fraction of what gets delivered by a lightning bolt. Is that a way of understanding that it's large? Does that make sense to y'all? One coulomb is a unit of charge, and in an electrical storm, you have something like a huge amount that gets delivered in a lightning strike, okay? So most of the things we're gonna be talking about in this class, we're gonna be using like micro coulombs. So it's a good idea to get familiar 
with, uh, yeah, if you took a shock of one coulombs, I don't know if, if we could generate something that big in the laboratory, but I'll show you some things in the lab that we can use to generate really, really, really big shocks. You know, of course, scientists, they, uh, they love to figure out how things work, right? And so as soon as they figured out how to build up big amounts of charge, um, this was, this was first figured out, to, I, I don't remember the person, but it was done in, in Leiden, which is in somewhere in north, northwestern Europe, maybe near the Netherlands, I think, or something like this. They developed these things called Leiden jars, and they learned how to store a ton of charge inside of them. And uh, supposedly the first person to really figure this out, I don't know if it was the first person, one of the people that was working with these things, these Leiden jars, which are basically just these, they're like, um, it's, a, it's like a, a glass jar. So it's just a jar, like what you think of as a jar. They basically found a way that they could store a bunch of charge inside of a jar. Think about it like modern day batteries, right? That's what batteries do, right? They store some charges that you can use to power your objects, right? So this would be the the precursor to batteries, right? When they first figured out how to do this, the guy stored a bunch of charge in this Leiden jar and he didn't know how much he had stored in there, you know? He walked up and he grabbed the jar and it supposedly knocked him across the room. He, he took such a shock that it knocked him completely across the room. Now you all have been hit by small shocks and they kind of hurt, right? Well, imagine getting hit by a shock inside of a laboratory that's equivalent to almost like a, getting hit by a lightning bolt, basically. How strong is a defibrillator? Um, I don't know how much charge gets delivered in a defibrillator off the top of my head, but we could go we could go look that up if you want to. Johnny, you want to look it up real quick, and maybe you can tell us the answer to that question? I don't know if it's going to deliver it in a charge. It'll probably deliver it in, like, a current, but we can, we can, we can, we can convert it. No problem. If you look up... Uh, how much charge is deliver delivered in a defibrillator. But that's a good thing to think about because a defibrillator is another example of where you're using an electric shock to wake up someone's heart, right? To restart their heart. Anyway, one coulomb, that is how we measure electric charges. So the question will become, can you convert coulombs to joules? You can convert coulombs to joules if you, um, you need to, you, you doesn't, it doesn't convert. That's a good question actually, by the way. Can I, let's, let's ask the question in a, in a more broad sense, if that's okay with you, Kyan. Can I take a Coulomb and can I write it in terms of other units? 0.12 Coulombs? Yeah, so that's a tenth of a Coulombs. It's pretty big, right? It's like a, it's like a hundredth of a lightning strike. It's a lot. Thanks for looking it up, Johnny. I didn't know that answer and now I'm glad that, I'm glad that you told me that. Huh. So you could actually describe what a coulomb is is by saying it's like getting it's like getting hit by ten defibrillators in a row. It's <laughs> a lot of that's a lot of defibrillator shots. All right. Um, okay. So you can't convert coulombs to joules. Okay. But you could. What would you have to multiply by? You need to use power. What is joules per coulomb? Yeah, voltage. So there's a way to do it, but you'd have to, uh, you'd multiply by a voltage. So to get from a coulomb to a joule, you'll have to multiply by a volt. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next couple, in the next week or so, okay? So we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Okay. So a coulomb is effectively, a, it's, it's not, we don't call it a fundamental unit, but you can't write the Coulomb in terms of other units, basically, is the simplest thing to say. I can't write, you know, like, for example, I can say one Newton. What's a Newton equal to in, like, the base units of SI? Do you all know? What's one Newton equal to? It's like a kilogram meter per second squared, isn't it? Exactly. Or a kilogram meter squared? You got it. The first one was right. Kilogram meter per second squared, right? So we know that a Newton is not a fundamental unit. We know that it's basically a mass multiplied by an acceleration or whatever you want to think about it as. You can think about it as a momentum multiplied by or divided by time if you want to. It doesn't really matter. The point is that it's not a fundamental unit, right? Um, other examples would of course be watts, joules, all these kind of things, right? So the question would become, can I write coulombs in terms of like kilograms, meters, and seconds? And you just can't, it's not possible. A coulomb is a coulomb. It's a fundamental kind of unit of, uh, of, of our universe in terms of the way that we think about things. So uh, cannot be broken down. A coulomb is a coulomb. But what we can do is we can say, how many electrons are there? In yes, it's exactly like kilogram, Kavi. Yeah. So what are the fundamental units? They are kilograms, meters, seconds. It's technically not coulomb. It's going to be current, which is the rate at which coulombs flow. 
It's basically the same thing. So we'll just say Coulomb. So meter, kilogram, second, Coulomb. And then you've got stuff like temperature, right? Kelvin temperature, that's another fundamental unit. And you've got stuff like luminosity, candelas. And I'm leaving one out. Maybe, maybe you all can tell me the one I'm leaving out. But uh, yeah. Coulomb is going to be one of our fundamental units, basically. Coulomb is a magnitude, by which you mean it's a scalar, probably, right? Yeah, it's, it's only a magnitude, yeah. Yeah, this is a scalar. It doesn't have a direction. It's not a vector or anything like that. So um, okay, so let's com let's let's talk about how many how many electrons do you need to make up one coulomb? Okay, and in order to understand that, we have to understand that an electron, okay, one electron has a charge, okay, a charge. By the way, the symbol we're going to use for electric charge is Q. And the charge on an electron, okay, Q, I'll just write it like this, the charge of an electron we usually use this symbol, little e, okay, and we say that it's equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, and it's negative. That's the charge on a single electron right there. And actually, I think that normally the way I want to write this actually is not quite like this. I think I want to write it like this. I want to say Q is equal to negative E. I want E to be just that number right there, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So an electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So approximately you need something like 10 to the 18 coulombs Sorry, 10 to the 18 electrons to get one coulomb of charge. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of electrons. Okay. Um, the charge on a proton. So protons. Charge of a proton is oops, exactly the opposite. So Q is equal to positive E. Charge on an electron is negative E. The charge on a proton is positive E. Right. If I have something like a plastic rod that has a bunch of negative charges, okay, then we say that this has a total charge that's going to be equal to, I'll use a capital Q for this one. It's going to be equal to some multiple of the charge of an electron and the charge of a proton. The reason why is because the electron is the fundamental unit of electric charge. And that means that if I have any amount of charge in an object, it's going to be equal to a whole number of electrons that give you that charge, right? And the way that we usually write that is plus or minus a whole number times E. So n is a whole number, meaning it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, up to a million, a billion, whatever you need. But it's not one and a half. You can't get one and a half electron charges on an object. And why not? You can't have one and a half electrons, right? What's half of an electron? What do you get if you cut an electron in half? Quarks. You don't. That's not. That's not. That's not quite right. Quarks are what you get when you uh, break break a proton down. What about the electron? Can we break electrons in half? As far as we know, you can. As far as we know, you cannot break electrons down. They are fundamental particles. They're stable. They're the little workforce of our universe these days. They they do all the work that 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 is done to pass information everywhere and to uh, light up your computer screens and all that kind of stuff, but we've never found half of an electron. We've never been able to produce enough energy to break an electron in half. Maybe someday we will be able to and we'll find more information about nature, but as far as we know, you can only have one, two, three, four, five, you can only have whole numbers of electrons, right? You can't have ten and a half electrons. So as a result, we know that charge is quantized, they say. In, in whole number units of the electron charge, okay? 
Does that make sense to you all? You can only have whole numbers of electrons. Electric charge is electrons, right? Electric charge is based, that, that's what this equation says. It says the electric charge on any object is equal to some number multiplied by the electron charge, okay? So if, for example, I have an object that has a charge of six microcoulombs, I could ask the question, um, how many electrons does it have? And just because electrons are negative, we'll make this negative. So suppose I have an object, I give you an object, and I tell you that the charge is six microcoulombs, okay? I tell you that it's negative. How many electrons would be, can, can, you, can you all figure this out for me? How many, if I, have a, if I have an object that's negative six microcoulombs, how many electrons does that object contain? Extra electrons, by the way. It's gonna have even more, but how many extra electrons? That's what I should say, how many extra electrons? So we'd use our basically conversion factor from up above where we say that an electron is 1.6 times or just negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Yeah. Oh, it looks like we got some answers here. Those answers look like they're about the right order of magnitude too. Okay, let's just go through a brief calculation here. So our goal is to find how many. So that means we're gonna find n, right? Let's rearrange our equation here. Our equation says that n is equal to q divided by uh, e, right, basically. I'm not gonna worry about the positive or negative sign here. Um, although I guess in this case it would be negative because q is negative. So q is negative six microcoulombs and micro is 10 times, or 10 to the negative six. So that goes up there, divided by negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And you get an answer, and it, and it has to be right almost because basically if you take 19 and you add 6, ne sorry, negative 19, and you add 6, you get negative, like, 13. And you guys are saying it's 10 to the 13, so that sounds about right. So you get about 3.75 times 10 to the 13. Man, that's a lot of electrons. So the N is equal to the number, so this is going to be electrons. I'll just put E minus E's. Uh, this is probably blocked by the screen, so what I'll do is I'll scroll down a little bit. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? All electric charges come from electrons. Anytime you, you see something that's negatively charged, micro, one micro is 10 to the negative six, that's right. Anytime you, 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 you hear about something being electrically charged, you know that it, is either, it has either extra electrons to make it negatively charged, or it has some deficiency of electrons that makes it positive, basically. Okay, anyone have any questions so far? Uh, because we were supposed to have started at, at 1.15, and we didn't quite start at 1.15, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and stop right now and take a break. Uh, we've been going for about 45 minutes. That's a pretty good timing on a break. So we're going to break until... Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I apologize if that was confusing. Um, see how we divide by plus or minus right here? I mean, I, I, I put the negative sign here because the object was negatively charged. So I wanted to divide by a negative. Whoops. I wanted to divide by a negative right here so we could get rid of the negatives. That's why I did that. Tian Wen. Does that make sense? Okay. It could be, po this number is going to be plus or minus. And if the object was positively charged, we would have just made this positive. So when it's negatively charged, we just make it negative. And the only the point of that is we, we just want to get a number basically, right? We want to get a number, not, we don't want to get a positive or negative number, we want to get a number. So, yeah, really good question. Okay, let's take a break until 10 minutes from now is, it's just changed, so 228.